Welcome to the Disability and Philanthropy Forum's 2022 webinar series. My name is Emily Harris, and I'm Executive Director of the Disability and Philanthropy Forum. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm proud to be part of the disability community. I come to you from the unceded land of the Council of Three Fires, the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi Nations, now known as Chicago. As part of our commitment to accessibility, our panelists and I will each provide an audio description of ourselves. I'm a white woman with dark curly hair, wearing rectangular glasses and a navy and white polka dot top. Behind me is a white and tan screen. My access needs are met today because we have cart captioning. A few housekeeping items for today's webinar. There are two ways to access our live captions today. Use the CC button at the bottom of your screen and choose subtitles or full transcript, which will pop up as a box on your screen within Zoom. Or to access the captions in a separate window, see the link to the external caption viewer on chat. Today, only our moderators and panelists will be on camera. You will be muted throughout the, the event. The webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording in the next few weeks. Although we will be using the chat to share links with you, it will not be available for you to communicate out. Instead, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to share your questions at any time during the session. And we will have some time to share them with the panelists at the end. If the Q&A is not accessible to you, feel free to send your questions to communications at disabilityphilanthropy.org. We will be tweeting today and hope that you will join us on social media using the hashtag disabilityphilanthropy. You can also follow along by connecting with us on Twitter at disphilanthropy. Before we start today's conversation, just a short reminder of how we define disability. Disability is a natural part of the human experience. According to the CDC, one in four US adults, 61 million people have a disability that impacts major life activities. Disabilities can be apparent such as a mobility disability, but many disabilities are non-apparent including chronic illness and mental health disabilities. Disabilities can be lifelong or acquired and we often say that we are the only minority group that anyone can join at any time. The COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare the systemic oppression of people with disabilities and is increasing the size of the disability community as we speak. Disability is more than a diagnosis. For many people, it is a community and a culture. This is particularly true in the arts community and we are in for a fascinating discussion today. To moderate our panel, I'm delighted to introduce Elizabeth Alexander, president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the nation's largest funder in arts and culture and humanities in higher education. A poet and renowned author herself, she's one of the 16 CEOs who serve on the President's Council on Disability Inclusion and Philanthropy, which founded the Disability and Philanthropy Forum, and is joined by three disabled artists, thought leaders, and advocates. You'll find the link to their bios in the chat. Take it away, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm very, very happy to be here today and excited about the conversation with these uh, terrific, creative, innovative, righteous folks. Uh, I'm president of the Mellon Foundation. Mellon is based in New York City, uh, the original lands of the Lenape people who were forcibly removed and continue to be dispossessed, land on which many people have lived, and as an organization committed to accurate and complex understandings of history, we at Mellon are currently engaged in a process of ongoing deep land acknowledgement work and learning and repair. Uh, I am a Black woman wearing um, big gold hoops and a blue top. I'm seated in front of a uh, painting, the portion of which is uh, abstract green, the watery deep, and was created by my late husband, Fikre Gebra Yesus. My pronouns are she, her, and my access needs are met today. I would now like to welcome our panelists. Joining us today are Lily Lanoff, author of One for All, 
Jen White Johnson, disabled artist, designer, educator, and activist, and Day Al Muhammad, author, filmmaker, and disability policy expert. Rather than read the bios of our panelists aloud, they've done so much uh, that is, is rich and extraordinary. We have posted links for your reference in the chat so we can get right to it. And I would also like the panelists themselves to introduce themselves uh, along with a sentence they would like us to know about themselves. So let's start with Jen, followed by Lily, and then Day. Jen. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, I'm Jen White Johnson coming to you from Baltimore, Maryland, home of the Piscataway people. Um, a quick image description of myself. I am a um, Afro Latina woman with caramel color skin. Um, I'm wearing purple earrings that say decolonize resist. And I'm wearing my favorite um, kind of leopard print or cheetah print uh, headband. And I have a gap in my teeth. And I'm wearing a yellow shirt that has a black power fist and underneath it says black disabled lives matter. It's one of my favorite t-shirts and a, of a symbol that I created for disability so solidarity on behalf of my black and brown disabled folks. Um, and I'm in my studio um, at home with a whole bunch of artwork behind me. Um, that says create and resist black disabled lives matter and uh, create more anti ableist spaces. And so um, I also uh, live with ADHD and also an autoimmune disorder. Um, and uh, I'm just so excited to be here as a mother, as a, an artist and a designer, um, and as an as an educator as well. I'm um, so happy so much to just kind of share my love and joy with everybody today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jen. Lily? Hi, everyone. And just to reiterate what Jen said, I'm also so excited to be here. Um, my name is Lily Lanoff. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am coming to you today from the land of the Anacostan people, which is also known as Washington, D.C. A visual description of myself. I'm a white woman with long um, curly brown hair. I'm wearing a blue shirt and a gray jacket. And behind me is a print of a black and white photograph um, against a tan wall. And there's an outline of a window on one side. Um, I have postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is also known as POTS for short, and a few other chronic illnesses as many people with POTS have. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to be here representing disabled writers. Um, and I'm also the founder of Disabled Kidlet Writers on Facebook. And I'm just excited to uh, chat with everybody today. Thank you, Lily. Day. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I'm super jazzed, I think, like everybody else to be here. My name is Dale Muhammad. My pronouns are she, her. I'm an Arab American woman, um, so brown skin, black hair. I'm rocking a great white stripe at the front right now. Um, I'm coming to you from the unceded lands of the Powhatan, the Pamunkey, and the Anacostan, which is kind of the Washington, D.C. region. Um, I'm actually at my office um, here in the White House, so there's absolutely nothing behind me. It's just a white wall, but I am rocking one of my favorite bright, bright purple shirts. Um, uh, I wear a lot of hats as a, as a filmmaker. Um, I was one of the founders of Forward Doc, Documentary Filmmakers with Disabilities. Uh, I'm also, among many other things, currently the Director of Disability Policy at the White House. So, however, today I'm here to talk about the arts and philanthropy, so I'm very excited about that. Fantastic, wonderful. Let's begin our conversation today by asking each of you to share your stories. Um, and the questions that I've asked that you think about is, um, what has shaped you? Little teeny tiny questions. What has shaped you as artists and activists? Uh, and how has your personal experience enriched and informed your understanding of disability arts and culture? And we'll start with Jen, followed by Lily and Day. Um, a note to the audience, um, because of my ADHD, I am hyperverbal, which means that I speak very fast. 
and also a credit to my Puerto Rican mother. Um, I use my hands a lot and I'm very, um, so uh, just a, you know, a, a quick note that I will do my best to speak nice and slow, but um, yeah, it's a really beautiful broad question that evolves every single day in terms of what my story is and especially what my disability journey is. And um, I've been undiagnosed ADHD since I was a little girl, um, partly because, you know, ADHD looks very differently in, in, in especially black little girls because we're excited and we're talkative and no one really views that as, you know, any kind of um, space that's rooted in disability because we're very joyful and we're happy. But, um, but I did, you know, struggle in school with, you know, staying quiet and kind of simmering down and I would get, you know, pulled out of class and I would get, you know, kind of rep reprimanded for talking a lot. Um, but I, I grew up in a very supportive household that allowed for me to um, be joyful and to express that individuality. Um, and I didn't even really grow up thinking that ADHD was a disability um, until my son was diagnosed um, as autistic and also as AD, you know, having ADHD. Um, and it wasn't until I started to notice a lot of really beautiful and, you know, kind of, um, you know, uh, <laughs> wild similarities between me and my child that I started to recognize how uncomfortable I was with, you know, the way that, you know, black and brown disabled folks and neurodivergent folks are viewed um, in the media, in visual culture, in the school system, um, you know, K through 12 and also in, in higher education. Um, I started to get really uncomfortable with how much joy was left out of the conversation um, and how rooted in ableism it was and how rooted in sadness in the, the charity model of disability that we have to eradicate and cure, um, you know, this neurodivergent soul um, and how we have to fix them and how we have to, you know, um, basically heal them. And I, I, I was like, this isn't the language that was preached in my household and I'm not going to preach it to my son as he's growing up and I'm, you know, um, you know, becoming introduced, you know, to autism culture, autism activism culture. And I just felt like I wasn't really seeing a lot of that community really amplified and really celebrated through art, you know, through photography, through graphic design, which are a lot of the things that that I really love to use to 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 just talk about disability and to uplift disability. Um, and I was very busy, you know, advocating for my son who was diagnosed at um, two years old. Um, and I was like, okay, you know, how do we move forward? How do we continue to to express to him that he's a great kid and that he's going to continue to be amazing? Um, and my ADHD started to become a lot more pronounced as I struggled with executive functioning, mothering, um, being a, a, a full time college professor, you know, which is something that is very rare among, you know, Afro Latina women being able to kind of, you know, um, teach and mother and all of that under the helm of neurodivergency. And I, I struggled a lot. I struggled a lot. Um, and I was very like micromanaged at times. I was, I was, you know, stigmatized. I was, I was, you know, oh, don't talk about your disability. Don't, don't talk about, you know, some of the things that are very personal to you. Um, you know, don't share with your students that you have a disability and, you know, don't, don't share with administration. And I was like, I don't want to continue to live my life under this umbrella of ableism, under this um, umbrella of stigma especially if I'm really trying to kind of emote acceptance and joy to my son, I'm going to have to start flipping that narrative and that script within myself. Um, and art, activism, and design really became a way for me to just channel all of what I wasn't seeing and to use that um, to give it, to share it, you know, to not create um, disability justice, you know, art and creativity in a silo, but to share it and to, to amplify it, you know, like Day, like Lily, um, we've been doing this work for a really long time. And, you know, people, some people have been following us for a minute and then others are just becoming very introduced to the work that we're doing. Um, and I just love that we're all speaking the same language, you know, but we really need support and we really need folks that are in 
industries or in philanthropy to realize that the work is being done and what are y'all going to do to kind of continue to uplift this culture that we're good at like we know how to how to we're in the trenches we're, we're in the ground um and we're ready to to work um and so yeah that's just my story in a nutshell um Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and I should have said early on, um, thank you to Destiny, who is our ASL interpreter and is uh, so beautifully and elegantly um, uh, um, doing her doing her thing. Thank you. Um, uh, when I as, was listening to you as well, um, Jen, I was thinking about a line from June Jordan's poem about my rights, a poem that, that many of you may know where she says, I am not wrong wrong is not my name. Um, and so um, let us uh, turn to Lily. Hi, so um, I didn't identify as disabled until I was um, an undergraduate in college, uh, partially because of stigma, partially because of the fact that I bought into the narrative that society tells us that if you can hide your disability, you should. And that is something to be ashamed of. I was diagnosed with POTS syndrome when I was 14 years old. So I had just started high school, a brand new high school. So I was learning to navigate high school while I was learning to navigate this body that was not really doing what it was supposed to be doing. At the same time, I was having to explain to so many students, other students and teachers, uh, what my condition was when I didn't really even understand it completely myself at that point. There were a lot of times when uh, I would struggle to get the accommodations that I needed. Teachers would refuse to give me the accommodations that were granted to me by my IEP. Um, I remember poignantly um, one, one memory in high school of being on the elevator and a security guard pulling me off the elevator, even though I had an elevator pass because she said that I didn't look like I belonged there. And so that informed both how I talked about my chronic illness and also how I felt about it. So before I went off to college, I decided that I was not going to tell anyone that I was disabled. I, because in my mind, telling people, these new people at college that I was disabled uh, would make it harder for me to make friends, would make it harder for me to find uh, anybody who would want to date me because we're taught that disabled people, specifically disabled women are not desirable. Um, and I thought that people would think I was weak. Um, obviously hiding a chronic illness and disability is pretty difficult, especially when those symptoms manifest physically. So that lasted for all of about a week. Um, and I realized, uh, because I was surrounded by people who supported me and friends who supported me that I felt comfortable in talking about my disability for the first time. Um, I still wasn't calling it a disability yet though. Um, and that didn't happen until I uh, was lucky enough to have an op-ed published by the Washington Post in which I talked about being a chronically ill teenager. And at that point, I had always wanted to be an author. I had always wanted to be a writer, but I very quickly realized after the outpouring of love and support but also messages from people who had pot saying, I didn't know anybody else who had this. Thank you for, for talking about this on, you know, in a national newspaper in this, you know, at the, in this large scale. Uh, I, I realized that um, it wasn't, I, it didn't just have to be about my words being in print, that they could mean something more, that I had the opportunity to use my platform, to use the thing that I love, which is writing to provide representation uh, for the teenager that I was and for teenagers today. Uh, and that's why I wrote One for All, which is my debut novel, which is one of the first 
if not the first, it's a bit hard to track with publishing, um, novels published by a major publisher with a main character with POTS syndrome, which is alarming since millions of people in America alone have POTS. Um, and it's also why I founded Disabled Kid Lit Writers, because I don't want to just help readers. It's also important to help support disabled writers who are coming up because uh, as Jen mentioned, we're doing the work. Disabled creatives are doing the work. Um, there are so many stories that have been written that just aren't getting the industry support that they need. Uh, and having making sure that there's um, a space, a community space for disabled creatives to support each other, but also to lift each other up and give each other advice and to try to push publishing for the better um, was what I wanted for disabled kid lit writers. Um, yes, and um, I'm just really excited to be chatting about this and uh, feel excited to hear Day speak too next. Thank you, Lily. Day. Oh my goodness. Wow, it, I, I, I think a lot of what you guys said really resonated because um, when Jen was going, I, I had to fight myself not to go, oh, did you get the notes back from your teacher that said talks too much in class? So I'm, I'm sure that was a part of it. So um, uh, in some ways my journey was, has been, is the same and in some ways a little different. I think we all have those same kind of things. So I've spent a lot of my time working around disability and policy and, and ways to improve and advocate for folks with disabilities. and. One of the things that's an important uh, piece to consider is disability isn't necessarily just defined by the laws that exist. It is defined by the values of the society in which it exists. And I think that is kind of what Lily alluded to. The law can say you shouldn't discriminate. The law should say folks with disabilities have the same rights, but it's the values of society and people in it that say, yeah, it's better if you hide that, or that's not really something that's considered important or a value. Um, and in some ways, disability culture uh, pushes against that. Disability culture in and of itself is a celebration of the uniqueness of disability. It's a recognition of the value that people with disabilities bring. It's, a, it's about pride. It's not about how we exist in society, but how we are driving and transforming that society. Um, and I think one of the key things as a part of that really also is the arts is one of the most powerful ways to impact culture. And so I think for many of us, it was a, this is how we can work on people, on getting them to, to recognize that yes, it, it exists as a part of, of the, the world um, as a whole. Um, and it can be just as simple as showing up. And I, and, um, I think Jen and, and Lily both referenced the idea of that representation of even being seen. Um, and I'll give a, a very short example. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm an American, Arab American woman with a disability. Um, I'm also queer. I'm, I have a wife. And it doesn't always come from conversation, but at, I, I have a lovely long bio. And at the very end, she lives in Washington, D.C. with her wife, Renee Brown. And I remember getting a note, um, or it's actually part of an article by someone who had, who had talked about the work that I had done, but what got them so excited was to recognize that I was part of her community, that I was a person with a disability who was queer. And I think that, and that representation works for disability, it works for race, um, it works for LGBTQ status, and it works for the intersections of any and all of these. Um, you know, we all uh, wanna be seen. We all wanna be part of the, the grand story. That's um, that's beautiful. I'm I'm really I'm really taking that in, and and you, the end of your answer is a, a perfect segue to what's next because uh, it, you know each of you is an advocate, an ad activist, someone uh, who works on behalf of others. So um, I would like to understand um, how you would describe um, when you came to consciousness 
about that work. I mean, it, you know, it's it's in the stories, it's in the story that you've told to Lily, but, you know, even to sharpen that and to talk as well um, about intersectionality uh, and about your own understanding of intersectionality in yourselves and in the communities that you speak to. Um, and that uh, if we could know of any uh, writers or, or artists who have been particularly clarifying to you on this part of your journey. And we'll start with Lily. Right, so uh, as you mentioned, um, I, I did speak a bit about this in my um, introduction, but uh, to build upon that, uh, like I said, I first identified as a disabled woman when I was an undergraduate in college. Because of that timing, I was also um, at the moment in my life when I was first being introduced to theoretical texts. Um, as an English major, but also just as an undergraduate in college. So I was reading books by um, Rosemary Garland Thompson, Extraordinary Bodies was my first disability theory text, which I was handed by um, my English professor, um, junior year um, professor, Jill Richards, um, who, if you're watching, thank you. Um, and uh, then I started reading books like Feminist Queer Crip by Alison Kafer, and trying to get as my hands on as many theory texts that I could about being disabled, but also being a woman, because I think that there's a really interesting dynamic in how we talk about disability and femininity or disability and being a woman. Um, and that's one of the things that I write about a lot, um, both in One For All and in my other texts. Um, my other short stories. Um, as far as other um, authors are concerned in terms of creative works, um, Marie Nishkamp and um, Emily Lloyd-Jones and Lee Padurgo are all really incredible disabled authors who are working um, in the kidlit space, um, the YA space, um, who laid the ground, who have laid the groundwork for other disabled authors to be able to write their stories and publish their stories. Because I think that one of the most difficult things about being a disabled author and publishing is that when you're trying to get published and you your agent submits um, your book to editors, uh, you have to prove in a way that your book will sell. And when there aren't any comp titles, which is um, a way of, um, it's a way of comparing your book to other books that are on the market. Um, if you don't have any comp titles, marketing departments can say, oh, well, we don't know if your book will sell, so we're just not going to buy it. Um, and when there's not a lot of books out there by disabled writers about disability and about disabled characters, what do you do? Just the cycle continues and you have to break the cycle, which is why those authors are so important and why I hope to continue um, their work by also laying groundwork for other disabled authors. Thank you, Day. And I completely forgot the question. I am so sorry. You know, no, just talking about your own, you know, as, as an activist, as an advocate, advocate um, you know, a sharp moment of sort of coming to consciousness about your work and purpose, um, uh, furthering the question of intersectionality, both as I mean, you've talked about this, but as you think about the communities that you serve and also important works of, of creativity uh, um, that have helped you um, shape your thinking. Sure. I, uh, I think a lot of the disability advocacy uh, ended up coming with me because I think when you have a visible disability, I'm visually impaired. I have a guide dog. It's not something I can I can put in my pocket and and uh, and and forget about or hide as easily. So wherever you go, you end up having to do that advocacy because you, you kind of don't have a choice. Um, and so so sometimes it's it's been a, a little um, difficult on that front. Um, but there are other places too where I think there's a choice to be made. Um, and early on, I, I started with writing before I moved into film and none of my early work included disability. And that wasn't an accident. It was a conscious choice because um, one of the early things they'll tell early creatives is, uh, and it's particularly writers, you don't put anything in unless there's a reason to put it in. So why should the character have a disability unless it's important to the story, unless it's a, a metaphor for something else. But that argument 
kind of erases the, the, the very idea that why can't there be a person with disability in there? Why, we exist. There shouldn't be a special reason to do that. Um, and that was that was one of the, the toughest things, uh, I think, in some ways to to kind of personally grasp and kind of be willing to break that and go, um, you know, what if I do this, is it going to sell? If I do this, am I hamstringing my own creative career? And for many folks early on, this was a very difficult um, decision for many folks to make. Um, and and so so I did solely have that going. Yeah, I need to I need to put up or shut up. If I'm willing to be an advocate in one arena, I should be doing the same in another. Um, and I think everybody's going to have that moment. And different people are comfortable at different points in their career. I'm like, I am certainly established now that I don't have a problem saying it anywhere and everywhere. But I also know some folks maybe aren't ready yet. And that's where um, having those models, having people out there like Lily and Jen, folks who are saying, I am here, I am doing this, you know, and Emily and others, it makes a difference in showing that. Um, I think one of the most powerful moments for me was I was sitting in the audience watching my first film at a theater um, in California, and it was The Invalid Corps. And it was a story about a bunch of disabled soldiers in the Civil War. Um, and, um, and immediately afterwards, were so many people asking, uh, saying, I never knew this. I thought I knew everything about the Civil War. Reenactors, historians, like me, this was, this is great. They wanted to know more. And it was a recognition that that for me, the, that the, it, it really, I think, sharpened the point that disability is a part of the story. And no matter what we may think of about the idea that it's not seen as important, there are folks who are hungry, who are desperate to find out the, these, this missing, um, and like I said, most of my stuff is more historical, these missing pieces of history, these missing stories, um, because uh, it, is, it is something that resonates with them that they've never even realized. Um, they were missing. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Lily and Day. So many beautiful gems. Um, thank you just for uh, uplifting how much art and, and design have just kind of helped encapsulate so much of what you do. Um, and so similar, just piggybacking off of what both of you said, you know, I, I was like searching and I just felt very empty. Um, when I was looking for design books or, you know, literature that helped to, uh, you know, define my story, especially as, you know, a black and brown woman, like Afro Latina, like it's disability is still very much viewed as a stigma. You know, no one wants to believe that, you know, if you're black and brown, if you're queer, that you will have a harder time being a disabled person. It's just like, you know, no one really wants to, talk about that or write about that. Um, and no one wants to celebrate that joy. And I was, you know, I was like, well, uh, I'm an artist and I can no longer keep this out of my art. Like I need to be able to kind of celebrate what so much of us don't celebrate and what so much of us want to hide and mask, which is something that we've talked about so much, um, especially when our, especially when there's just a, a constant war on black and brown lives like seriously like i mean like 19 children were just murdered you know that were all you know latino um in buffalo i mean you know there there's a war on black and brown people like there are countless names um you know corin Gaines, you know stefan watts like so many beautiful black and brown souls that were disabled who are no longer with us just because of their of their disability and what they felt like they couldn't communicate or the support that they didn't have or how much they were invalidated um, because of their disabilities. Um, and so I was like, well, who's really speaking about race? Who's really speaking about race and disability? You know, and that's when I started, you know, looking at the beautiful disability justice work of Sins Invalid and, and all of the work that that those folks were doing so unapologetically. And one of the the books that really stood out to me in the beginning um, of my own like autistic neurodivergent journey, you know, with my son embracing so many different aspects of like 
of autism activism culture was all the weight of our dreams uh, on living racialized autism by you know edited by you know Lydia Brown the amazing amazing Lydia and Morenique you know Jiwa Unau um, and being able to kind of oh like so there are folks that are actually speaking about the intersection of race and disability and what that does to us and how um, it's often not viewed as this empowering thing to be. Um, and that book is filled with poems and essays and, and it's like so thick and it's just like so beautiful. And I was like, wow, like there's actually people writing um, about this, but it's like, it's such a cult classic that like you wouldn't even know about it unless you were really entrenched in, you know, advocacy and activism because so often activism, advocacy and disability aren't necessarily all rooted within the, the, the same universe, you know? It's very much rooted in how can we re research autism so that we can eradicate it, so that we can completely nix it out of, out of the, you know, how can we, you know, research chronic pain so that you no longer have to, you know, experience that. Um, not not how, how can you just live with it and really celebrate all of the, the amazing things that you can do, you know? Um, and so I knew that early on that I was like, well, what is this journey going going to mean? Um, and how can I continue to to show up for my community knowing that like not all of us are isolated, not all of us create in a silo. Um, what can we do to really speak this really beautiful language that that we're just holding in and we feel like we're we're alone, you know? Um, and and so one of the the first books that 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 I wrote was entitled Knox Rocks. And what you see here is me and, and, and my son, like, you know, a few years after he was diagnosed as autistic. Um, and I'm still really finding my own neurodivergent journey. And, and it's just showing us kind of like, rolling around on the carpet, you know, like just in in in, in disability love and celebration and joy. And I was very much opposed to writing a book about him specifically celebrating disability with me on the cover, but my but my independent publishers, Homie House Press, God bless them, um, you know, small publishing house, um, not a huge, you know, widely recognized, you know, uh, press. Um, they were like, no, Jen, like it's really important to be able to put you and your son on this cover about disability disability celebration because oftentimes you don't see that really beautiful pure moment until it's too late until either i'm no longer here i've been you know pulled over by the police or i've been murdered or my son has been pulled over by the police and he's gone um oftentimes <laughs> and this is just this is just what what happens this is an everyday like language and vernacular that 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 we that we speak you know i'm not making this up um and so it's like how often do we get a chance to kind of celebrate who we are the pureness and the 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 loveliness and the joyfulness of our disability while we're still alive to be able to tell that story um and that's what i want to do i want to be able to kind of proclaim in the moment um you know who we are and how we should love on each other thank you um i'm gonna zoom us through the next couple questions rather than have everyone answer i'm gonna direct each of them to one of you, um, because uh, our audience has questions as well. And I want to make sure that we get to that. Um, but uh, Lily, this is a wild card. This is not in the preparation, but I'm so curious um, as a, um, a literary person, um, what you think when you hear in Jen's talk, the word joy repeated, the word love repeated, how, what, what do you, what do you, take with that and how do you respond to that in thinking about um this moment your work the movement um something that it, this is highly specific but um something that was really important to me when i wrote one for all was that it ended on a moment of um disabled joy and the last sentence of one for all has been the same last sentence since the very first draft it's and I smiled mm, mm, mm. and I knew that that was the one sentence I mean in edits that was the one sentence I was not going to change yeah. <laughs> um yeah. and um, I mean of course there were other things that I 
was very adamant about not changing them edits like the authentic representation of disability and the authentic representation of being a chronically old teenager but I didn't want one for all uh, to end on a moment of misery and I think that publishing is getting better um, but it's getting better very slowly uh, there are a lot of books um, because publishing thinks that that's what sells well, where you know the only chronic illness representation that we get is sick lit, which is um, stories that romanticize um, terminal illness or chronic illness. Um, and usually they end with at least one character dying. And not only is it an, a, a, it's gotten to the point where it's not even a trope. It's just, it's at least, I mean, if you're going to be ableist, at least don't bore them. I bore me. It's at least don't bore us to say people were used to. <laughs> it's very typical. Um, you know, we, I'm used to reading about the disabled character that dies tragically in the hero's arms in order to advance the main character's character arc or to teach the readers about the fragility of humanity. Uh, that's very typical. Um, but as Jen was saying, this idea of love and of joy, I think is really important. And that's not to say that I don't think that books by disabled writers about disability that look at pain and look at uh, ableism and that look at suffering aren't important because they are important because most of those books are also not getting the recognition that they deserve or and are not also not forwarded by the market it's usually um books uh by non-disabled writers who are writing what they view to be as disability suffering as about all these things um but i think that it's also important to kind of marry the two together so in One for All, there's a lot of discussion about um, ableism and internalized ableism. Um, and it's funny because uh, a lot of people ask me, oh, well, is there a love story in One for All? And what I like to respond is, is that the big love story in One for All is that Tanya, my main character, it's her learning to love herself. Um, and I think that um, that's an important thing. Um, that I think that Jen's work does, and that I think Bay's work does, um, and that your work does, Elizabeth, but to um, to encourage readers to um, love themselves as they are, or to be authentic about themselves, or to be open about themselves as they are. Um, and, I, and I think that's important for all ages, but I think especially for teenagers and young adults and for middle schoolers and even younger, I think that, you know, you're at such foundational um, stage in your life and um, formative stage of your life that the books that you read are really going to influence you and shape you as a person. And so it's bittersweet being able to, you know, looking back and thinking about, well, what would my life have been like um, if I had had the work that Jen was making or that Day was making or that you were making, Elizabeth, or that I was making? Like, what would what would my life has have been like as a chronically ill teenager if I were, was reading books that showed people like me uh, in a way that encouraged me to not feel ashamed and to feel joy instead? Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, one of the most important things that our work can do is to further that latter point, is to encourage self-love and joy and just acceptance of everyone and ourselves in general. Thank you so much. Um, and please put your questions in the chat. We're, we're just about there. Um, Day, what do you think is the unique role of disability arts in centering equity and, and social justice, not just in philanthropy, but in society as a whole? So, yeah, I had to think about that. I'm like, so I, I think the, the biggest uh, thing, and I alluded to it earlier, is that um, is uh, 
the arts and disability in the arts, particularly when it is centered, um, has the ability to change culture. It has the ability to change the way we think about things. Um, and, and so many things we may not even realize. If, if I go, may the force be with you, we all know whether you have seen the movies or not, there's, it's, it is part of the zeitgeist. And there's an expectation you know, of kind of what that story is, even if you don't know the details of it. So if you see people with disabilities as heroic or as joyful, and that is what you're hearing, it, it actually kind of creates this, this, this idea of what being disabled is. And when the arts historically may have only showed up folks as, um, you, know, um, you know, the angry disabled person, the victim, the villain, the person who's cured, uh, the metaphor for something else, or somebody um, who basically has to die so the main character learns a good lesson, right? Um, that's, that's all you see. Um, and that actually has real world ramifications too. So if you see a disabled life as lesser, then, you know, one, what happens to you or a family member, or we can give examples from as recently as during this last pandemic, when they are talking about uh, priority of care, who gets care in an overburdened hospital. And, and in real life, hospitals were putting people with disabilities lower on the list for care, not because they were less likely to survive COVID, but because of the perception of disability as less. And, and that, and, and the fact that arts can actually change that because the law actually, and, and there were, there were, yes, there actually was legal intervention to address that because yes, it is illegal, but the law wasn't what the problem, I mean, was so much. It's, it's the perceptions that people have. Um, and a law is cold and inflexible and it's not something that's at the top of people's minds, but that idea of film and television and arts, that's how you slowly change the way people view things. And so that's why I think having disability centered is so important. That's also why I think having disabled artists are centered. It's the part of any kind of community. There's very nuanced storytelling. And one of the toughest things is, is to make sure you're supporting that. And, and I, will, I will put that out there specifically because in film, there have been films about disability. People with disabilities have had no roles of power in the creation of those films, which means they often follow stereotypes, those same kind of tropes. They, they meet those same kinds of uh, problematic ableist um, kind of structures. And so that becomes, and that I think is one that is more directly connected to philanthropy insofar as when funding, who are you funding? And those projects, who controls them? Is it, it it's, and, and in film in particular, it's real big on, we'll bring in a consultant. You can bring in a disabled consultant, but a disabled consultant on a film set does not have as much power as say the director or the producer. So, so it's one of those things where who controls makes such a big difference. And I think that's why centering not just of the content around disability, but as in who has the right to tell those stories. And I'm not saying disabled people are the only ones, but I'm saying there should be uh, uh, a locus of control that's a part, that, is, that is recognized there. Otherwise you're missing some of the nuanced storytelling and the depth of what makes it actually meaningful. Thank you. And, and that also gives us a segue to, I'm going to call out a few audience questions and want to conclude uh, with asking each of you uh, uh, for your sort of prescription for philanthropy. Um, we'll, we, we need to hear that. Um, so that's where we're driving. Um, but before that, um, here's a question and I don't see who asked them, so I won't say your names um, because I don't know them. Um, uh, how have you, uh, and, and again, let's, let's just sort of, you know, Take it if take catch the ball if you if you like the question um, uh, so we can get a lot on the table. Um, how have you filled your creative well uh, while being disabled during a pandemic? Do you have any effective tips for other disabled creatives to do the same? So there's a lot of specificity in there, and also I think just the broader question uh, of uh, when you have you know work that is challenging and out there, uh, how do you also think about uh, what you're bringing forth from within and how you protect that? Anybody can take it. Yeah, I mean I don't mind answering that that question. Um, because a lot of people, it, it took the pandemic 
for a lot of folks to realize that d disabled people existed um, and, and finally started paying attention to what we had to say. Um, and I knew that, um, you know, early on that we really, that disabled people really had to, you know, exhibit like, the, you know, the one principle of, of disability justice, you know, like leadership of the most impacted, like we really had to kind of be out there, you know, at the forefront, um, leading this conversation on, you know, how millions of people were going to be left permanently disabled because of COVID. Um, and advocacy requests that we had that the disabled community were requesting even before the pandemic began that we weren't getting access to you know for example you know like you know virtual conferences and interpreters and things like that that were so important that we had always been advocating for um and virtual activism and virtual creative activism really just came alive because disabled folks i felt like we were finally able in, in some interesting way to take control of the conversation and um like personally for me i just started making artwork and i just started sharing it for free i started making downloadable resources you know printable posters that people could use in protests and that's what really helped and that's how i ended up meeting day for the first time two years ago on like the hottest day of june on june 6 we marched all the way from gw university all the way down to the white house with our other mm. stable advocates like justice shorter carrie gray um mia ives Rublé was there we were all like just we all headed down to the white house you know some of us were you know rocking the black disabled lives matter shirt some of us we're rocking this poster that you see here in the background that says Black Disabled Lives Matter with um, a black power fist that kind of has the infinity symbol here um, that amplifies neurodiver neurodiversity. And it really just came from us, you know, just like showing up, being there, making the artwork. We weren't getting paid to do any of this. We just kind of just used our knowledge, used our resources, shared resources to just create our own virtual activism and then when we felt comfortable we just kind of spread it um we, we got out there we marched um and so the work can be done you don't create it in a silo and as long as you're just there i mean i was blessed because people were paying attention folks were passing my name along um but it really just started with me not waiting to be asked to do something like i just had to do it um so yeah so i'm definitely happy to kind of like continue that chat with whoever answered that that question later um because of yeah. mm -hmm. um we the 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 clock is 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 not our friend today um but um i'm gonna um the, the the question where we were going is actually what people are asking about so i'm gonna throw a few more questions out that are under this larger rubric what advice would you give foundations that support arts and culture institutions that are not accessible to disabled people? What advice would you give foundations? Uh, oh, sorry, there's another one. Um, what is, um, uh, how would you help uh, foundations uh, uh, move their work forward, uh, uh, their disability work forward? How can philanthropy better support independent artists? with disabilities. So all of this under the question of how would you eat, what would you each prescribe uh, for philanthropy? That's what we want to know. So yes, please, Day, uh, start with oh, Day. All yes. right, so uh, hopefully you guys will forgive me. I, I, am, I am known because I have a list of six things that I always recommend because I don't see them and they and, and I think it works very well for this audience. So um, and I think some will be ones you guys agree with and you might have others. So one specific inclusion of disability. A lot of folks are talking about diversity, but disability I actually think needs to be called out specifically. And I'll give a very good example. ITVS has a has a diversity grant, does not include disability. Um, and I think knowing you're welcome makes a big difference. Um, and so that means you can have disability specific programs, but if you do anything that's diversity, please put it in there, use the word, it's not a bad thing. Two, data collection. Um, for any kinds of grant stuff, collect demo, you're, I'm assuming you are collecting demographics, and if not, you should, as an optional measure, you should know about race, you should know about LGBTQ status, and you should know about disability. Who are you funding? 
um, and make it, you know, you can make it optional, but this is, this is important to know your projects, your programs, your membership. And what's also important is leadership. You know, how many folks with disabilities are in, in roles? And this relates to the comment I made earlier about who controls. Um, three, um, outreach. If you are not finding folks with disabilities, you need to start looking in new and different places. Um, and I think that's, that's where there are groups. I think Lily mentioned, um, uh, uh, can, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher the name of it, and I even know it. I'm like I'm a member. Of, Disabled Kidlet Writers. Thank you. You know you can find a, a, a plethora of folks, and there's some who actually are contracted with with mainstream publishers, some who are working independent, some who are still trying to get an agent or finishing their novel. But you can find folks. Um, you know, four um, is is to recognize that no one thing is going to to be it. So create more, create broadly. Um, and that's not just to artists, but also recognition for philanthropists. Like um, someone's going to complain that that one for all does not cover pots. Well, I'm like, no, it, it covers Lily's experience. Um, and I refer to this as the Wonder Woman problem, right? In the Justice League, you just have Wonder Woman as the one woman, which means she has to represent all women, which means nobody's going to be happy. Amongst the guys, you could have Batman, you can have Superman, you can have Aquaman. They can show different facets of masculinity, but Wonder Woman has to do it all. So recognize you have to have more than one. I, I, and I've heard, uh, I have heard a grantor say, we already gave out a, a disability grant this year. We don't need to do another one. So that is actual language. Um, so, I, and I'm, I'm also gonna put a note in there also to recognize a lot of times when you're given funding, you wanna know that it's gonna be successful, especially if it's early on. Recognize that folks with disabilities may not have had a chance to build up the experience or the resume you might otherwise see. Um, and so sometimes it might be a little more risk-taking and that has to do with the problems we already have with society and values. Um, five, put disability everywhere. Um, one of the biggest problems is you'll see disability panels, you'll see diversity panels, but you won't see a person with a disability on a directing panel or on a panel on, uh, you know, uh, was it a cutting edge design, right? Or, uh, uh, or uh, character development. And the thing is, who you lift up for what you lift up is what they're viewed as an expert. If I'm only seen as an expert in disability and Lily's only seen as somebody who can write about pots and, and you know, Jen's dealing with that, Jen's that whole autistic and ADHD writing thing, then, then what it does is it creates that one dimensional element. So, so those artists are never seen as anything other than their identity, which is true of multiple identities. So the idea is make sure you put disability in a variety of programs and you don't, you know, especially the ones that have nothing to do with it. So look for it everywhere. And the last item six is to speak out about that diversity and disability everywhere. Uh, I make it a point if I'm asked to speak somewhere, hey, is there gonna be accessibility or do you have captions? I don't use captions, I'm blind, I can't see them, but I will ask about them. And if you don't have them, I'm not going to attend. Um, and it's really hard to put it on the folks with disabilities to ask for the stuff all the time. So there's nothing hurting folks without disabilities. If you're in a panel about diversity, you're in the audience, raise your hand and be one of those folks asking a question about it. Um, you know, if you are putting together uh, a jury for determining, um, uh, determining who gets grants or funding or as part of a, a gallery showing, do you have anybody with a disability on there, even if it has nothing to do with disability? So that speaking out, it is your industry too. And so you have a responsibility not to make it a more diverse industry, but to make it a better one. Okay, so that's my six. Yeah, but you know what? You just did it. <laughs> Can we co-sign uh, on the six? Yeah, everything, add, everything I was gonna say, Dace. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Um, well, I think we, what we're going to have to do now is wrap it up. I'm going to turn the mic back to Emily, aware that um, in this beautiful and rich conversation, we couldn't get to everything, but we got to so very, very much. So thank you so much for, um, for all you do and for all you are and for all you brought to this hour. And I turn it back to Emily. Thank you so much. This has been incredible. And yes, Elizabeth, you already have co-signed because the Mellon Foundation is one of the signatories of the Disability Inclusion Pledge. And they're very similar principles to what um, Day just described. So if you work in philanthropy, please check out the pledge and consider signing it. You'll receive a short survey after um, this session. Please fill it out to help us 
plan our next uh, learning series, and we hope you'll join us for the next session um, uh, on economic justice in September. Uh, thank you so much for the panel joining us um, today. We all learned a tremendous amount. And please check out disabilityandphilanthropy.org, the Disability and Philanthropy Forum. We will take your questions and use that to inform the resources that we are currently developing. And we'll be sending out a lot of the references that the panelists mentioned in a follow-up email along with the recording of this webinar. Thank you, thank you, and please fill out our survey before you leave. Thank you, and this does conclude today's webinar. Have a fabulous day. Thanks all. Bye-bye.